Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all keeping well, good to see you again. Well, unfortunately, no game again for me yesterday. It's gone a bit quiet at the minute, so not quite sure what's going on, but I'll keep pushing for a bit more work. So, obviously the last three sports videos have generated quite a few questions in the comments sections, and <laughs> there's been that many comments, can't thank you enough guys for, uh, for getting the algorithm going, because I know the algorithm works even better when there's a lot of comments, so thanks ever, ever so much for all them. And I am trying to answer them all as best I can, just picking 10 minutes and going through 10 or 20 and answering them. I'm getting there now. But I just thought I'd grab some of the questions off the comments and answer them on film, just to get a bit of creative chat going and that. And um, if, I, if my answers to these questions aren't quite what you agree with, you can put a comment below and uh, we'll have another chat perhaps. Perhaps I ought to start doing a few Q and A's once every fortnight, uh, uh, once every couple of months or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, yeah, something, something to think about in the future. So keep firing in your questions because if I can't answer them, I know other guys that read the comments often do answer them. So so it's great and it, it gets a nice chat going. That's what it's all about. This is why I set up my YouTube channel mainly for the sports before COVID, was because when I went into sports. It was all secret squirrel. It was all quite hush hush. So you really do. You really are on your own when you start off in the sport industry. And I thought, let's see if I can change that a bit and uh, and help help guys out and let let you guys know how I started. You know. Anyway, I'm blabbering on. Let's get on with these questions. Right. First one from Scott Henderson. The benefits of having a card reader. Now I think Scott sends. You have to let me know if I'm wrong, Scott. But reading your comment, I think you. Use the wireless function on your 1DX Mark III and just obviously send them direct to your laptop. Now that's brilliant and it's it's really quick, it's instant, hit the send button and it's gone. A bit like when I send remote back to the desk. But if that fails or if your Wi-Fi fails or something, you've no way of obviously downloading your images. And you do need to take them physically off that card. And as in my video last week or the week before, I've actually got two CF card readers on the back of my laptop just in case one goes. Obviously, if I'm sending remote, then I'm hitting that send button and it's going via FTP straight off to the to back to the office. But even when I am down as a remote game, I've always got them card readers because you can still obviously download it and then send it on the FTP details via the via the laptop. So I've always got at least two card readers with me. Obviously, the the Mac that I've got has got um an SD slot on the side so sometimes if I'm using my 5D4 the SD slot uh, card goes straight into the slot but I have always got a card reader it's an absolute must especially with any photography but especially when you're in photojournalism and you need to get images off quick so yeah definitely 110% you need a card reader if not a spare and like I said a couple of weeks ago Sometimes I've lent out that spare if someone else's card reader has, has failed. So yeah, I always, always carry two or three in my bag anyway. So uh, yeah, definitely a must to have a card reader. Massive benefit. Right, what we got next? Um, Photo Sportif has sent this one in. And he says he struggles to switch lenses and he can't get comfortable. Now, <laughs> as funny as it is, I used to practice. Let me just turn that ISO down a bit. It's a bit. That's better. I used to practice this at home. I used to get the Minimax stool out and sit at home when I first started, and I'd just practice swinging the 400 onto my shoulder, and then do I have my 70 to 200 hung down the side of me so that I can quickly spin and catch, you know, a bit, a bit like grabbing a pistol, or do I have my 70 to 200 hung down the front? And I find it's better if it's hung to the side of me. Because I can literally, I know where it is. I can be watching watching the game and you swing the 400 away, get that on your shoulder. I do have to keep my shoulder up a bit just to just to cup it a bit to make sure that it's it's right, it's sat right. You know, and sometimes you have to hold your head as well and then you have to, you know, it's a bit of a juggling act. But it's just, if you can get into a good routine and every time you're doing that right and then you just, you don't even have to look where your 70 to 200 is. You can feel where it is and bang, you've missed one, two seconds worth of action. Um, so yeah, I, I practice that quite a lot at home just to get the routine right and uh, it pays off, practice pays off, doesn't it? So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Right, Steve Bailey. He was wondering how to approach agencies and which agencies to join and how to 
make you work your way up the ladder. And this time last year, I made a video on how I all got started. I started with Action Plus on commission, um, and I was with them nearly four seasons. Now, not only did I shoot football, I shot so many different sports. Now, I was on commission, so I was only earning from the images that I sold. Tough, tough going. It really is for the love of it when you're on commission. You know, I mean, I used to go into London quite regular. I'd do a nil-nil game and I'd, I'd, I'd leave at three, four in the afternoon, get to the ground, you know, two or three hours before, shoot the game, all the editing after the game, drive home, get home about one, two in the morning, not earn a penny off it. But it wasn't all about the money, and it still isn't all about the money. I still love doing the job. It's a privilege to get paid now. But it was to build that portfolio. Um, so I would say you've got to have minimum of, I don't know, five, ten years good portfolio experience before you can aim for them bigger agencies. It's just it's getting steps up the ladder. And uh, I was fortunate enough that when I moved, when I was down in Hampshire, I was in a patch where it... There wasn't many PA photographers about, and I just fell in, it, probably more luck than judgment, I just fell into that little area between Southampton and Bournemouth and managed to get up that ladder and, and, and get on the shift work, on, on the, the day rate work instead of on the commission. But it is tough, it is tough, but you've just got to plough away and build up as strong a portfolio as you can. And then when you think you've got a good portfolio, you will know when you've got a good portfolio with several different sports in it, several different disciplines. Telling the story, you need to show a, a person on the street who has nothing to do with sport, you need to show them a picture and say, you tell me what's going on in that image. And if they can tell you exactly what's going on in that image, it's a good one. And that's the sort of images that you want in your portfolio. And that's the sort of images that when these bigger, bigger agencies ask for your portfolio, you're confident to give them that. So it's a long old drawn, drawn out process. But yeah, start with the, the smaller agencies and then get that portfolio built and work your way up. And it will come. It will come. Honestly, it will. A lot of blood, sweat and tears and a lot of nil-nil games with no stories coming out of them. But it will come. Just got to keep at it. So I hope that answers your question, Steve. Right, next one. Liam Tuhill. Editing process in bad weather, and he's put in the rain. Is it different? Well, it is. It's a, it's it's a lot more awkward. But I'm sure most of you guys know. I've got um, I've got an old look at the state of that now. <laughs> it's a proper old eye cap, but everything just becomes more more. It, it, you're all in in this little tent that I've got here. I'm sure most of you have got them, but I'm not sh I'm not sure if Liam has. Basically, it's just a. Not been out for a while. Look at the state of that. I need a new one. <laughs> Look at it. But yeah, just a little tent goes up and uh, obviously zip it together. Laptop sits in there. And uh, which way is it? That way. So your laptop's in there, your card reader's in there, everything's in there, nice and waterproof. Obviously, you've got to get your head in and things still do get wet. It's just a case of picking and choosing when you need to send that image. Now, if there's a goal, that image has got to go as quick as you can. So you've got to. I sometimes have a chamois leather over my laptop if it's raining, if, if it's blustery as well. and um, That's called an eye cap, by the way, an eye cap. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to fold it up because they're tricky to fold up again. Could be here half an hour. But yeah, everything's in there. My chamois leathers, my spare cards, because when I take one card out to, you know, to download it, I'll put the other card straight in so you don't miss any action. It is a lot more tricky in the rain, but it is doable. And it's just a case of knowing if there's no great images for a story, then... I don't risk even getting the laptop open and getting it wet. There's no point. You can just shoot the game until something happens that you think there might be a story for, mainly for the online clients, and then open the laptop, get the chamois leather, just dry everything off if the rain is blowing in, and uh, get sent, and then shut down again, push the laptop to the back, and carry on shooting. So it, it is trickier. None of us like photographing games in the rain. It's awful, but it's got to be done. And them eye caps, and there are, the other, other makes are available, out there, um, they are they are a godsend. Them little tents. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, and uh, perhaps um, look out for an eye cap if you haven't got anything yet. But uh, anyway, right, next one, Paul Kerr. How do I get paid? <laughs> well, I probably just covered it in that last the, the last um, question before the last answer for Steve Bailey. Obviously, I was on commission for quite a number of years. Um, it's just a case of doing a bit of research and finding out what story might come from a game. 
you know, to, and it might make a massive difference to how, how your commission works and how you get paid. If you get that shot and every paper wants it, you're going to get, you know, a few quid out of it. But yeah, so I worked up and worked up and worked up and now I am on a day rate. So I get a day rate and I'll, it, uh, that day will probably usually be about between 10 and 12 hours and I'll just get a set rate for it and that's it. So I won't get any, a lot of people say, I know my dad bless him when I show him a picture of, of, of a publication in the paper. It's, oh, how much did you get for that? Do you get extra? No, dad, don't get any extra. Just get a day rate and that's it. Seeing your work published in all the national papers is just the icing on the cake, really. But um, yeah, so I'm now on a day rate. It's taken some blood, sweat and tears to get on that day rate, but a really privileged position. And um, yeah, so that's how I get paid on a, on a day rate system. Right, what have we got next? Stanislav. Ah, yes, he's, he's noticed that when, I'm, when I've done my edit workflow, I'm just hitting uh, the F key and it saves the image to what I call my today's folder. And then I open that today's folder in Photo Mechanic, scroll, um, crop round it and send it. And he was wondering how I do that and that's just a simple action. So before the game, I'll take a shot of anything and then I'll just set up an action in Photoshop, which is basically save to, close, and that's it. And then when I've edited that image, I'll just hit F3. It will send it straight to the today's folder. I'll then go into Photo Mechanic, open that today's folder. There's the saved image, the edited image. Draw a box around it for the crop that I want, and then send it off on the FTP. So yeah, just I always set up an action before every game, and then it obviously, because you have to set it to set, save it in the right folder for that game. So yeah, I'll, I'll make an action when I'm when I'm sending off the laptop. Always make an action, and then it just saves going into file, into save, choosing the file, and it's done in seconds. So yeah, setting up an action, and you do that if I, in the Windows tab, Windows tab at the top, actions, and then just hit record. Set up your action, which which F key you want it to be. So I'm always F3, just so that I know that hit the F3 and it saves. And then just go through the process, click stop, and that's your action saved for the day. So yeah, that's an action to send images to my today's folder. Right, who's next? Robin Hooper. Where's the best place to set up or to sit for a rugby match? Probably very similar to my football as well. Now I always try and position myself. The standard place, if I can get, is right on the edge of the 18 yard line. And I suppose in rugby it would be just, if you can imagine the center point on the touch line, the rear touch line, if you like, from the, the rugby posts to the corner flag, I'd just be sort of three quarters of the way to the flag. Because usually rugby players, they'll try and score a try if they can. They usually head to the corner. I'm not a great rugby photographer, but from the, from the tries that I've always photographed and been a bit like the try a couple of weeks ago at Leicester Tigers, it was right in near the corner, right in front of me. So I'll sit there and then you've got, you've definitely got half the pitch covered. And then if there is a try, the other side of the pitch towards the other flag, you can lean back and you can usually get the 400. If you know, if you know the player's running to that other corner flag, you can stay on the 400 and hopefully just lean back and catch the try and then any celebration that there is yeah so i would always be half certainly at football it'd be half the half, the 18 yard line i'd try and sit somewhere around there because obviously the celebrations either run past you or you get a good angle for the goal or for rugby three quarters of the way to the corner flag from the rugby post that's where i'd go so yeah hopefully that answers your question that'd be standard obviously if we're not allowed there like at leicester tigers we're up in the stand i'd still try and get somewhere in that area to get the try coming towards me. But obviously the lower angle for rugby, the better, because you can get them tries diving right over. You can almost get underneath them, you know. But anyway, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Robin. Robert Hall, which shutter speed for rugby? Ever, uh, very similar to, to most action sports, really. If I can be at 2,000th of a second when there's good light, that's what I'll be at, whether it be rugby, football, athletics, whatever, you know. Sometimes with athletics or with pan blurs, you'd, you'd go down to 800th or... Six, six hundredth, something like that, five fortieth, just to get a pan blur. But um, yeah, always, if I can, at least sixteen hundredth. Minimum would be twelve fiftieth if there's bad light. You don't want to get them ISOs up too high, but if I can and it's a nice bright day, rugby, football, any sport, horse racing, anything, you want to 
you want to freeze that action, always, at, I'll try and get to one in two thousandths of a, of a second shutter speed. So hope that answers your question, Robin. Max Du... <laughs> I can't pronounce your name. Maxine. Maxine Dupili or Dupili. And he has asked, when do I choose to send images through a game? Usually, I'll just keep firing and firing and firing until I think there's a story. And once there's a story, whether it be a yellow card, red card, sending off bad foul, anything that you think the online clients are going to want to report on, that's when I would download the card. Obviously, a goal. If there's a goal, the card goes straight in in the celebration. But there's no point in following the action and thinking, oh, I think I'll download the card now, because you could miss something. There's no point. So I only ever download my card when something has happened that I think there's a relevant story to go with it, either online or for tomorrow's papers, you know. Sometimes that can be 20, 30 minutes. If it's a slow game or a slow event, whatever you're doing, there's no need to, to download, really, because these card readers are so quick nowadays. You can, you know, two or 300 images are downloaded in seconds. So there's no rush there. So yeah, it would only be if I think there's an important image that's going to go with a story mainly for online use, you know, for instant online use. So that all the client, all the online clients can can get that story out with a picture as well. So yeah, only when there's a, a story about would I download usually. Right, on to the next piece of paper. <laughs> Dylan Jones, shooting under floodlights. I think Dylan's just started out and he's a bit worried about shooting under floodlights. Now obviously Premier League, uh, championship, most championship games. I think most of the, the Premier League and championship grounds now are on LED lights, so you don't get any of that flickering. But I know when I used to shoot at Portsmouth, and if you did a, a burst on the manager, and it was quite dark, one frame would be green, one frame would be yellow, then green, then yellow, and it is really tricky. Now I always, I know when I used to shoot at Eastleigh in, in the evenings, their floodlights were obviously non-league, it was they were quite poor floodlights really, bless them. And I would be down to a 600th at, at times. I didn't want to up that ISO overly high and overly silly to keep my shutter speed at 1250th or 1000th. I think most clients are happy if not all the frame is sharp. You don't have to... There's nothing worse than having a noisy, grainy image just because you're at ISO... I don't know, 25,000 or something, just to keep that shut speed up to 1600th of a second, there'd be no point. Just means you've got to pan a bit more. So I will always, I'll keep an eye on my ISOs and I will rely on my ISOs a lot. Obviously F2.8 you need to be at. But anywhere down to 650th or, or an 800th, you can just about get away with. Especially with Photoshop, you can take shadows out, you can brighten most images up. You can denoise now, which is great. There's nothing that you can't do in Photoshop and Lightroom nowadays. But if you, if there's one setting that I would have to alter to make sure I grab the action and didn't have a poor quality frame, i.e. too noisy, I would lower the shutter speed. And again, you can lower it and just test quickly, have a look. Now that we're all digital, you can have a look on the back if, it's, if it is too soft, if the ball is really soft then you'd have to up your shutter speed a bit, which would obviously, obviously increase the ISO. But yeah, definitely keep an eye on your ISOs. Don't go mad on your ISOs. Always, I would try and just, just lose a bit of quality on the image if you need to, because I think we can get away with, dare I say it, poorer quality images under low light floodlit conditions, because your clients will understand that you've got no light to work with anyway. Um, and then if, like at Eastleigh, it was always quite yellow, quite an orangey yellow glow under them old floodlights, if you like, the old bulbs, I would just alter my white balance shift, put a bit of blue in it or a bit of red in it, you know, just to just to try and minimise that, to try and get it as, as natural as you can. Probably shoot in auto white balance. Um, I, I think I've usually shot in auto white balance and uh, or, or in Kelvin and just worked it out. Because you're on digital, you can... You can you can take a few shots and get that set up before the game, really. If it's dark when you arrive, you can get all that set up, your white balance shift before the game starts. But yeah, keep an eye on your ISO. Certainly do rely on your ISOs, but if you need to, don't be afraid to bring your shutter speed down a bit. Right, I hope that's helped you out, Dylan. Debbie Gold or Gould asks, auto white balance or an individual setting? Now, I've always found that auto white balance during a bright day isn't very good for your colours. I've never really shot an auto white balance. Sometimes I have just to give it a try, but I'm usually in cloud 
or in the the shadow, the little shed with the lines coming off the roof. I'm in I'm in one of them two modes really. I just think that cloud gives me a little bit of a better colour, a little bit more depth in the colour, you know, a bit more saturated and um, contrasty, you know. But uh, yeah, don't really shoot in auto white balance. It's always in. Again, you can do do a quick test, shoot in auto white balance, then flick it to cloud then flick it onto the shade, you know, or onto, if it's a bright sunny day, just work your way through them, it only takes a minute, snap away, and then you can pick which one looks best on the back of the screen, and there you are. But yeah, hardly ever white balance, I'm usually in cloud, I think I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, yeah, usually in cloud. Right, Hong Kong Fooey. <laughs> how many, oh sorry, he says, how do I get the pictures, the, the, the files, so vibrant, he must have an eagle eye, Hong Kong Fooey, how basically how my how come my raw files straight out of the camera are so bright vibrant? That's basically because I've altered the saturation in camera, I've altered the contrast, the sharpening, um, yeah, saturation, and that's mainly for when I'm shooting remote and I've got uh, an editor sat back in the office. The less work he can do on that, he or she can do on that image, the better it'll be. I'm 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 not happy if I'm sending poor quality images out for them guys to then edit for a minute or two before they then send them to the client because the whole point of being remote is so that it's instant. I can hit that send, put a caption into it, hit send, they can say blah blah blah, crop it a bit if they need to, send it. So yeah, I'll I've all, I always alter my saturation contrast con um what else is in there? There's all sorts in there. Obviously, the shadows you can you can alter it all in camera, and that's what I'll try and do. And it's it's also handy if I'm editing myself. The less I have to do on the laptop, the better as well. The less the less action I'm going to miss out on. So yeah, I would always alter it um, in camera. So that's why they look quite vibrant when they first downloaded onto the laptop because I've already given them I bumped up the saturation, the contrast, and everything. So yeah, and the clarity, I like to give it a bit of clarity as well because it really does make them images pop, you know. So yeah, yeah, all altered in camera to the to the best of that I can before it then goes off or gets downloaded. Right, William Timothy. Ah, right, so William's just been asked to shoot at his local ground and he's wondering how much to charge. Now that is a massive question. Depends what you're going to be giving to the club. If you're giving them every image that you take, then really, if you if you have got a day job like most of us do have, and you and you're going to be at a ground at eight hours, you want to be looking at a day rate really. So you know any anything. I, I think a lot. I think the national uh, non-league paper and the and the league paper they 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 pay about fifty pound, which I don't know. Bit 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 less for me. A bit too small for me. That I'd I'd be looking at a minimum of a hundred pound really to to photograph a game because there's so much that. These clubs can get out of your imagery, whether it's adverts, whether it's using them in the programs, you know, by no means do you want to be underselling yourself. So I would say a minimum of £100, really. You know, most of us would be happy with £100 a day if we were on a building site or perhaps even more. I don't know. But, um, you know, on your general, general work day, £100, £150, you know, something like that. Definitely don't undersell yourself. So, yeah. In between, if you're confident that you can provide a good set, a good strong set of images, then 100, 125, 150 pound, I would say around that figure, something like that. But uh, it's all on what, how confident you are with your photography and what you think you can provide. And but certainly the bottom figure would be 50 pound, I would say. So yeah, so hopefully that's helped Timothy. It is really tricky talking money, especially when they, you know, they if they're coming to you, then they should be they should be willing to pay you. A good day rate, so aim between fifty and hundred pounds to start with, and see how you get on. Right, battery's going flat on this, so I'm just going to swap it over, and then we'll carry on. Right, battery changed. Where were we? Uh, oh yeah, William Timothy, how much to charge? So we've done that one. What have we got next? Um, done that one. How often do we download the cards? Oh, Philip Logan asks, out of, well, how many images do I take? Let's just turn that ISO down a bit. The sun's come out. It's shining through the window. How many images do I take on your average day, on your average game, compared, and out of that amount, how many are sent? Well, I would say on a busy game, 
I'm up to 1000 frames probably. That's a lot of bursts obviously. A slow game would be probably four or five hundred. And a slow game I would probably have probably sent from the game itself 40 to 50 frames and then second edit frames probably 20 or 30, so 70. On a busy game, where there's a lot of goals obviously, that's going to increase quite significantly. So um, it's gone dark again. Crikey, the sun keeps coming in and out. I'll do. Um, I would say on average, I know when I've counted before, 70 or 80 frames of keepers that actually get sent edited back to the desk. Now that could be up to, I don't know, 800 or 1,000 frames taken, but obviously there's a lot of bursts. You know, as a player is running towards you, you might burst him for 10, 15 frames. If, it, if, you know, if you can see a tackle's going to be coming in, you'll just be, I'll just be, you know, and uh, only one of them will get used. So there's a lot going in the bin that never see the light of day. But yeah, on average, I would say on average, if you say a thousand images taken at a busy game, I bet you there'd be about 70 or 80 images total, including second edits, that, that go, go to the desk. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Philip. Right, Leo... I think that's Winter. Leo Winter asks, how early do we get to a game? Three o'clock game, I'll try and get to the ground for 12 to half past, two and a half hours early. It just There's nothing worse than rushing. So I like to get there, get signed in. I know through COVID, some grounds weren't letting us in till an hour and a half before, before kick-off, which is quite a rush, really. But obviously, once we were in the ground, it wasn't too bad. But on a normal day, pre-COVID if you like, I'd get to a ground or, or, you know, me and my colleagues would get to the ground at least two and a half, three hours early, get in there, sign in, get your place in the press room, you know, you have, have a quick look through the programme, obviously go outside, set, set up where, you know, leave your stool where you want to sit for the first half, test the Wi-Fi, if I, if I was remote, I'd try and get a wire in, test all that, set your bodies up, you know, before you know it, there's only an hour and a half to go before kickoff nip outside, get some fans arriving just to start your set off. Then by the time you've done that, it could be quarter past two, head back in, then 20 minutes, half an hour of warm up, and before you know it, kickoff's there. So yeah, at least two and a half hours earlier than kickoff as a rule. So yeah, anywhere between 12 and a half past for a three o'clock kickoff, you know. Um, evening matches are exactly the same, get there nice and early, you know. Um, yeah, just to start that set off with the fans and it's nice if you can get a nice stadium picture, a nice stadium frame, totally empty, you know, just the groundsman or something about, just to start off your set to see what the ground looks like empty. So, yeah, it's always good. But as a rule, two and a half, three hours early. Right. Marcello Gilber, not sure. Sorry, Marcello. He says, Dart, he was obviously looking at one of my older videos and he said, Darts must be so boring. It isn't. Darts is fantastic. Obviously, for those of you that watch World Darts at Ali Pali, at Alexandra Palace in London, with every dart thrown, you've got crowd reaction, so you can shoot that until your heart's content. I mean, it's great fun. They're all fancy in fancy dress, and you can really get a great set of just fancy dress dark, dark punters, you know. So, yeah, but with each dart thrown, they could... They could it's a bit like cricket, with each ball bowled, there could be a story come out of it. So you have got to really concentrate on every throw or every, you know, every dart that's thrown, you can get a reaction from the from the, the player. So yeah, it's it's not boring at all. It's it's quite intense, you know. And then obviously we would do a set and then the players would go off for a break. We'd shoot back, download, edit, straight back out for the next set. Or at least you might still be sat in the press room sending off that last set and then you might watch the set on the telly just to keep an eye on it and then zim out there but yeah it's it's not boring at all Marcello no it's uh, it's quite exciting I love it great atmosphere um, obviously you can't hear yourself think because they're all cheering and, and having a beer or two but yeah it's, there's 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 so many options for photography at the darts it's brilliant it, you can really fill your boots and we can shoot in three different angles and, uh, you know, you can get the whole hockey in, the whole dartboard in, both players in. You can go tight to the player, you know, just the dart and the front of his face, you know, with the 400 and the 1.4 converter or whatever. But, um, yeah, yeah, so darts is far... And it's quite challenging as well because it's quite dark in there and there's a lot of purple light and so you've got to make sure your white balance shift is correct and all that. So, yeah, there's, it's, quite a challenge, it's quite challenging as well. That's what I enjoy. I enjoy the challenge of the darts. 
And uh, But yeah, you've got to have your eye in about six different places at Dart. So yeah, it's not boring. But uh, have a go at it, Marcello. See what you think and let us know. But uh, right, and finally, last one is from Barry B. And he wants to know what what tells me when to change from the 400 to the 70 to 200. That is one of the bugbears of sports photography, is especially football and rugby and anything where the players are running towards you. When do you change? And I've lost count of the amount of times that I've changed too early and then the players took a shot and I'm on the 70 to 200 and I know when I look at that frame and I've got to crop right in and pull it right in. There's nothing worse than pulling an image right in and losing quality that I should have stayed on the 400 longer. Over time, obviously, pra practice makes perfect-ish. But um, sometimes when a player's running towards me and he's filling the frame in landscape orientation, I'll spin the 400 into portrait orientation and carry on shooting until his head and his feet are filling the frame. And it, hopefully, usually at that distance, if I'm sat on that 18 yard line, if he's filling the frame in portrait, he's about to have a shot. Or he's gonna pass it to someone else and you can get the pass, then you can go to 70 to 200. So I will try and stay on that 400 for as long as you dare. Every now and again it backfires and you'll you'll miss some action. I think when I was at, uh, I think the first sports video I did, I stayed on this player a bit too long, bit too long, bit too long. He, and he took a shot, but I'd shot the bottom of the ball off. But I still, it was still a lovely depth to the shot, you know, because I was at 2.8 on that new 400 that I've been using, the Mark II. Lovely depth, but I just clipped the bottom of the football off. But it still got used and uh, it made a great shot and uh, so, so much better quality than going on to the 70 to 200 at 200 and having to pull it right in and crop it. The quality is just not the same. You can't beat the 400. So, yeah, there is no real trigger point when to swap. It really is. You're watching the action. Is he going to shoot? Is he going to pass? Is he going to, you know, what, what is he going to do? You've got to read it. And then at the very last second, bosh onto your shoulder and back in. Hopefully not missing the shot or or a save or whatever. So yeah, there's no real there's no real trigger point, but it's all it's all about reading it as it's happening in front of you. Sometimes I get it wrong, uh, sometimes I get it right, but uh, yeah. So anyway, that's all the questions I got noted down. I didn't want this video to be too long because you'll all get bored. But um, that's just a few general questions. Keep them coming in, and I say I might I might start doing this once a month or something, you know. And um, it's just nice to generate a bit of chat between us and. Uh, Answering these questions generates more questions. So, um, yeah, keep sending them in. And um, I hope you enjoyed that, guys. Sorry there was no no football or any other sport this week. Fingers crossed next week there should be something. And uh, I'll be back, back pitch side. But thanks ever so much for watching, guys. Appreciate all your support, as always. Have a great week. Catch up soon.